Imagine leading one of Canada's most feared outlaw motorcycle clubs, controlling entire drug trade, and then shaking hands with your sworn enemy, all while the cameras are rolling. Sounds like a movie plot, right? Well, it's not. This is the real life story of Maurice Mom Boucher of the Hells Angels from orchestrating a truce that fooled an entire nation to finding himself on the wrong side of the law time and time again. Maurice Boucher's life is a roller coaster of ups, downs, betrayals, and battles. Today, we unpack the complexities, the controversies, and the jaw dropping moments that make up this legend of MC culture. Let's get into it. Canada's peaceful and prosperous province of Quebec was rocked by the bloodiest motorcycle conflict in motorcycle history in the late 1990s. The Rock Machine MC and the Hells Angels, two competing outlaw motorcycle clubs, fought bloodily for the control of a thriving drug trade in Quebec. There were almost 160 fatalities, 300 injuries, and a number of explosion and arson tactics as a result of this brutal fight. Maurice Boucher's intent was clear, establishing the Hells Angels in Canada. It was said that he had a startling lack of compassion for human life in his pursuit of his goals, killing bystanders and even children without hesitation. A loose confederation of other gangs, outlaw motorcycle clubs, and shady street outlaws banded together to foil his schemes and avoid a Hells Angels monopoly. It became nearly hard to put an end to the street wars as the violence grew and law enforcement became entangled in a web of corruption and lies. Authorities finally got the upper hand in this nightmare cycle of violence after two police officers were killed and a member of the Hells Angels turned informant. Who exactly was Maurice Boucher, the mastermind of all this chaos? Boucher was born in 1953 and had a difficult upbringing. His father, a construction worker with an alcohol problem, was physically abusive, and his mother was the only person who ever really cared for him. Andre Desjardins, a member of the Montreal Mafia who brutally governed the local construction workers' unions, had an early influence on Boucher. Because of his upbringing, Boucher came to consider violence as a necessary evil. Because of his problems with alcohol and drug addiction, his teachers labeled him as an indifferent student and he eventually dropped out of high school. Boucher was unable to maintain gainful employment and therefore turned to crime to finance his addictions. At the age of 19, he was already serving time for robbing a 7-Eleven. Prison became a regular part of his life and each stay made him stronger and more determined than the last. A police psychologist diagnosed him as emotionally unresponsive throughout his time behind bars, calling him cold-hearted because of the childhood torture he suffered. He had been in and out of prison for years due to offenses like armed robbery and home invasion. Boucher eventually got a job at a Montreal plastics plant. He never held a legitimate job for more than four years. Simultaneously, he enrolled in the SS, a white nationalist motorcycle organization. As he advanced in his career, he became good friends with Salvatore Cassetta. Andre Bouchard, a future police captain and one of Boucher's harshest opponents, once said he was muscle, he was crazy. Some dude would be sent out to be beaten up by him. But I must warn you that despite his enthusiasm for the limelight, he was a terrible public speaker. But don't take that as a sign of stupidity. The man was a born leader who could easily influence others. He would have became a great manager if he had stayed on the correct track, but fear, not admiration, fueled the respect people have for him. The Montreal group of the Hells Angels underwent significant change while Boucher was in jail. The Lavelle group's notoriety plummeted after reports of widespread rule breaking and drug use. The Angels' upper management had to make a tough call because of their reckless play. Shocking 
even the criminal underworld. They ambushed and killed every member of the Lavelle chapter. The Angels' upper management had to make a tough call because of their reckless play. They ambushed and killed every member of the Lavelle chapter in what became known as the Lennoxville Massacre. Discuss Phil Salvatore Cassetta's heart. This brutal betrayal went against all he believed in. He started his own rival club, the Rock Machine, rather than join the Hells Angels. But for Boucher, the massacre was an impressive show of force. Upon his release from prison in 1986, he wasted no time in signing up with the Hells Angels. Boucher rose quickly to power after the massacre at Lennoxville left the old leadership destroyed. In 1987, he had already been elected president of the Montreal section. He was revered as a deity by his soldiers because of the extraordinary severity and his men dubbed him Mom for his careful, protective supervision of operations. Boucher wasted little time in pursuing his goal of controlling the whole drug industry in Quebec. He set out to do away with the now vulnerable Outlaws MC first. He annihilated the Outlaws with his wits and his fists, driving them from Quebec. By betraying an informant that had previously worked with the Outlaws, Boucher ensured that the Hells Angels would remain in control of the province. They had recently formed a mutually beneficial alliance with the Mafia in Montreal. The Mafia would bring drugs into the county from Colombian cartels and the Angels would distribute them. This partnership made perfect sense from a criminal perspective. The Mafia had access to high-level politicians and worldwide networks but could only recruit ethnic Italians while the French Canadian Hells Angels had the muscle. Boucher's ultimate goal was to have his Hells Angels motorcycle club become the dominant force in the trade in Quebec. It wouldn't be easy though. The Rock Machine was a strong adversary that controlled a network of establishments across Montreal, including restaurants and nightclubs. The fact that Boucher had previously been acquainted with the Rock Machine's leader, Salvatore Cassetta, who had powerful connections with the Montreal mob, made things even more complicated. Any action taken against the Rock Machine carried the potential to spark an intervention by the Mafia. Then came 1994. Cassetta was arrested with 440 kilos of cocaine. The cell doors locked behind him and the rock machine was left in disarray. Boucher pounced on his perfect opportunity. His men strolled into businesses run by the rock machine and made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Join the angels in the trade or see your enterprise burn to the ground. Many caved in. Those who didn't would have their homes set on fire if they didn't comply. It didn't end there though. Every shady operator in Quebec was given terrifying ultimatums from the Hells Angels. Deal only with us or become an enemy. Even though they were outnumbered and outgunned, the Rock Machine weren't going to surrender. Where did they go from there? In order to combat the Angels, they banded together with anti-Angels groups, such as the Pelletier Clan and the Dark Circle, two major actors in the Montreal scene. Conflict had begun. When the Rock Machine went off on July 13th, 1994, it caused quite a tremor in the outlaw world as a warning that they couldn't be bullied. They shot and killed a member of the Hells Angels. It was an unexpected turn of events. Authorities in Quebec broke up a conspiracy by the rock machine to attack the Angels clubhouse. The Angels got taken by surprise, hastily convened a meeting to discuss the situation. They all came to the same conclusion. War must be declared. An unstable time of retaliatory bloodshed ensued. The Angels' ability to render Sylvain Pelletier, an important member of the Alliance, ineffective was a turning point. Then, a daring plot to kill Boucher was developed. The restaurant he frequently visited had a truck full of dynamite parked outside. Parking violation, however, caused the truck to be hauled away and saved Boucher's life. The death toll had risen by the year's end of 1994. Because of the close and hierarchical character of these clubs, the authorities were unable to infiltrate them. The decade-long waiting list to join meant that police informants couldn't penetrate the group, especially because they were forbidden from engaging in illegal activities themselves. 1995 was an unexpected year. Danny Kane was a member of the group that worked with the Angels, but he betrayed them. Kane had become disillusioned with the Hells Angels after a box expedition to expand their jurisdiction into Ontario. The police were able to catch a break thanks to his inside knowledge. Boucher was living a dangerous, secretive life, and it was only thanks to Benoit Roberg 
a high-ranking detective that Kane revealed Boucher had police operatives working for him and passing him information. Roberge eventually entered a guilty plea for gang activity. Boucher expanded his empire by founding a new chapter of the Hells Angels, the Nomads. The chapter exemplified more rock and roll because it was made up of the club's most elite members and had no set location, which meant that they were dangerously unhinged even by biker standards. They secured their supply of cocaine from the notorious Rizzuto family and the West Seng gang and therefore had a virtual monopoly on distribution across Canada. Boucher had matured into an extremely self-controlled man by this time. He was a morning person. He met with his angels at 9.30 a.m., usually in the presence of his lawyer, which was a cunning way to avoid the discussions recorded by the police. He amassed a fortune in crime and moved his lavish lifestyle to Montreal before expanding into Mexico, but the risks associated with his unlawful behavior were real. After an argument with the warden, mass guys on Harley Davidson's set fire to his home while he was in jail. He befriended lifer Stéphane Gagné in jail, who went by the name Goddessy and Oshu. They collaborated on illicit endeavors, plotted and schemed to grow their operation, and ultimately became formidable players in the criminal underground of Quebec and beyond. After being released from prison in 1996, Stéphane Gagné immediately returned to the club world and joined one of the Hells Angels rival groups, the Rockers. Boucher's ingenuity as a strategist is on full display as he installs a whole surveillance system, complete with high-tech hidden cameras tucked away in an inconspicuous place like a Kleenex box. Gagné immediately got the work, stationing these surveillance vehicles all around them. Boucher seizes the opportunity presented by the death of a relative of a major mafia player. He gives Gagné strict orders to capture everything, including license plates and at the burial. Eliminating the Controni family would be the final step in solidifying his reign. Get ready for the next terrifying occurrence that will shock the world. Both Mark Duby, the low-level drug dealer the Jeep was headed after, and Daniel Disrochers, the innocent 11-year-old, were killed in the explosion. Boucher and another heavy hitter, Steinhardt, had planned this as a part of a cold-blooded strategy to pin the murders on the rival rock machine. When the first Hells Angels member is murdered in the tragedy, it sets off a chain reaction of bombings. Boucher sees global dominance rather than merely regional. He avoids the mafia and instead deals with the origin of the problem, the Colombian drug lords. From the Gaspé Peninsula in Canada to the busy streets of Montreal and beyond, a new pipeline had been set up. Boucher's reach is so great that even respectable banks would use the process payments for his drugs. Meanwhile, Boucher's suspicions of an informant among his staff only intensified. He became fixated on finding the mole, going so far as to plot random murders of justice-related personnel in order to sow confusion and ultimately reveal the identity of the informant. When the hitman for the Hells Angels turns informant after a slew of other criminal figures are given reduced sentences, tensions rise to a breaking point. Apologetic, Boucher redoubles his plan to begin killing those involved in the law enforcement community. Prison guards, the lowest rung of the justice system in Boucher's eyes, were the first to fall. Gagné and André Tous to sung it. Two of his thugs murdered a prison guard in a frightening act of violence. The uproar from the public was quick and intense. Commander Bouchard steps in to lead Operation Harm, which aims to trap these bold murderers. The regular haunts are all caught in the dragnet, from taverns and restaurants to strip clubs run by the Hells Angels. Fighting erupts during a raid on a strip joint. When the call for backup is answered, Commander Bouchard smacks a Hells Angel in the face and demands, who's next? However, the procedure wasn't merely for show. It was a success for the police. 60 illicit firearms, 2.5 million in cocaine, and multiple arrests. A Peruvian drug lord who was one of the captives made an effort to avoid further punishment, and he implicated Stefan Gagne as the gunman. The arrest and subsequent breakdown of Gagne not only implicates him, but also reveals Boucher as the mastermind behind the horrific deeds. A turning point occurs when Boucher is apprehended and charged with first-degree murder on December 18, 1997. But it would be a mistake to imagine that this broke the cycle of violence. The founding member of the rival band, Rock Machine, John Plesho, was murdered in his own house. When the membership list of the secret corporate organization 
known as the Dark Circle is leaked, the plot thickens even further. The end result, the assassination of several successful local entrepreneurs. Some of the group's survivors made the decision to give themselves in rather than face the alternative of being buried alive. So drama in the courtroom began. Judge Jean Guy Boulard, nicknamed Quebec's most feared judge, presided over the Boucher trial. Surprisingly, he took a strong stand in the favor of Boucher, finding in his favor on multiple occasions and ultimately dismissing significant pieces of evidence. The Hells Angels had been seen dressed in court in their club colors as a part of their intimidation strategy. In the end, Boucher was cleared of all charges by the jury. The news devastated Commander Bouchard. He decided to go to a boxing bout at the Molson Center in the heart of Montreal as a distraction. What he witnessed that night would forever change him. The crowd erupted in cheers, said Boucher, and just like Moses parting the Red Sea, there emerged Maurice Mont Boucher, adorned in full Hells Angels colors, flanked by his local crew. The audience reaction was a standing ovation, as if Maurice Boucher were a rock star, was the final straw for Bouchard. Because of his recent acquittal, Boucher had become something of a local hero in Montreal. The onlookers would go crazy whenever he rode through the town on his motorbike. According to surveys, he was also highly regarded in his home province of Quebec. Meanwhile, Kane was starting to feel the effects of his undercover work as an informant. He was a nervous wreck, and his behavior was getting stranger by the day. He would frequently play jokes on the RCMP by calling them and handing the phone to a prostitute who would brag about his virality, as if the situation couldn't get much worse. Fighting broke out once more. In a terrifying scene, assassins working for the Hells Angels mistook an innocent laborer named Serge for his intended target and promptly shot him in the head. This sparked a wave of retaliatory violence that claimed the lives of Rock Machine Commander Tony Plesho and Boucher's close friend Norman Hamill, among others. Not long later, Boucher made an audacious move with his money. He sought forgiveness from Andre Desjardins, a powerful loan shark and former construction union head for a friend's large loan. In other words, Desjardins was unimpressed and told Boucher to get away. Desjardins' body was discovered a few days later with 11 bullet holes in his head. Despite Commander Bouchard's efforts to question Boucher about Desjardins' murder, all he received in return were crocodile tears. A trial revealed that Boucher had planned to overthrow the dominant Montreal Mafia and that he had ordered Desjardins' murder as part of that strategy. Michelle Auger, a journalist, was busy at the same time unearthing these shady dealings. His public profile made him a target, yet he narrowly avoided death in a shocking assassination attempt. As a result, calls for tougher anti-gang legislation spread across the country and the Montreal mob was frightened enough to broker peace between the rival motorcycle clubs. On October 8th, 2000, Maurice Montboucher and Foucher sat down at the Blue Martin restaurant where the air was filled with the smells of a Thanksgiving feast. Tabloid photographers' lights illuminated the room as the two sworn foes shook hands, hugged, and shared a meal, a symbolic gesture in French Canada that is as close you can go as declaring peace. The show continued, however. They took a newfound peace to the next level by visiting Super Sex, Montreal's fanciest strip club on Rue St. Catherine. The cameras kept rolling, recording everything that happened. Journalist Julian Cher and William Marston later noted, however, this was not a happy ending about mortal rivals reconciling. It was, in fact, a clever public relations stunt. By late 2000, the Hells Angels had accomplished their goal of dominating the Quebec drug trade. The pretense of calm was shattered in a Montreal courtroom on October 10th. Just two days later, the concept of double jeopardy was surprisingly overturned when the judge ruled that the jury in Boucher's 1998 trial had been intimidated and been given incorrect instructions by Justice Bollard. France Charbonneau, the Crown's attorney, made a compelling case that the judge pro-defense bias warranted a fresh trial. Boucher was convicted of many counts, including two counts of first-degree murder. Thanks to the information gathered by the deceased informant Kane, who was discovered dead under strange circumstances. However, Boucher's trouble continued even while he was incarcerated. Three separate attempts were made on his life, including with a bazooka that was thwarted by fellow convicts. Maurice Boucher had been imprisoned with the St. Anne 
Des Plaines Penitentiary for 22 years, where he served a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Boucher winded up dying in prison of throat cancer. Truly one of the legends of MC culture. If there's other people that you want to hear stories about, let me know that in the comments. And if you want to support the role, you know we've been demonetized. Get your Demons Row mask now. They're on www.demonsroad.com and follow our second channel, the Sos the Ghost channel. And thank you for tuning in to Demons Road TV, the holy grail of MC culture. Like, subscribe, and comment. And oh yeah, we ghosting, baby.